All right, so why don't we get things started? So welcome to the Ezra Roundtable Seminar Series. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Jacob Mays. So uh, Jacob is an assistant professor in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering. We're very happy to have him join us. Um, he's going to share his applications in stochastic optimization and statistical learning in energy systems. Um, we're really excited to have Jacob. He brings insights into some critical issues in terms of thinking about energy market design and thinking about some of the transitions that confront us uh, as we move forward. He has a diverse background, so he has a degree from Harvard in chemistry and physics as an undergrad. He had a master's of engineering and energy systems from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He took that breath and then headed off to Evanston, if I'm not mistaken, at Northwestern, hanging out uh, on the shores of Lake Michigan and eating great food in and around that area. Uh, and he got his PhD in industrial engineering and management sciences. And from there to here, and so with that, uh, thank you, Jacob, for volunteering and uh, looking forward to your seminar. Great, thanks, Pat. So as Pat mentioned, today I'm going to be talking about uh, a couple uh, topics related to electricity markets. I've titled this Electricity Markets Under Deep Decarbonization. Uh, it's kind of a, a broad title, uh, but I'll, I'll talk specifically about two projects, one that's uh, ongoing and one that uh, was published last year. So uh, we're here in New York. If, if you read the, if you follow the news in New York, you may have seen a headline like this, uh, New York to approve one of the world's most ambitious climate plans. This was last year uh, that the state pledged to eliminate net greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 with all of its electricity coming from carbon-free sources. So the, the genesis of this, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, is uh, the, uh, the Paris climate targets or the, the climate targets more generally, where if we want to limit warming or projected warming to the 1.5 degree or two degree level uh, above, above pre-industrial uh, levels, we really need a rapid uh, decline in carbon emissions from the energy system. So on this chart, this is from the Global Carbon Project. You can see where we are. We're in this black line increasing worldwide emissions. And in order to meet those targets, we really need a really steep uh, decline. So the New York target, which is 2050, is on the early side of these uh, trajectories to meet the, uh, the 1.5 uh, degrees. Uh, New York isn't alone. So really across the country and, and uh, brought more broadly worldwide, states and utilities and countries have been making a variety of clean energy commitments that entail 80 to 100 percent reductions in carbon emissions depend on, depending on where you go. So this is a map from the, the Clean Air Task Force uh, where you can, you can see a lot of the more densely populated uh, areas of the U.S. already have commitments from utilities or states or legally binding uh, commitments to uh, reduce carbon by 80 to 100 percent. So a first reasonable question to ask is, uh, is this possible? So we have these ambitious uh, targets to, to reduce carbon uh, in, over the next uh, three decades. And, and so a lot of groups have been putting in effort into trying to figure out, is this technically achievable? If so, at what cost? Uh, so this report just came out a, a month ago. Uh, their conclusion was the United States can uh, achieve 90% clean carbon-free electricity nationwide by 2035, dependably at no extra cost to consumers and without new fossil fuel plants. Um, uh, another group, this is a consulting firm. Uh, they did a study a couple months ago for California. They say simulations show up to 90% of California's power can come from a combination of wind, solar batteries, and geothermal. Uh, all carbon-free sources. Um, a, another recent uh, modeling effort uh, from the U.S. Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project, they modeled economy-wide, not just electricity, and they decided that an 80% by 2050 target is both technically viable and affordable, costing about 1% of GDP. Uh, there's a, a huge uh, number of these models that are being put together uh, to try to demonstrate that this is at least technically achievable and, uh, and we have reason to believe that it could be done at, uh, at reasonable cost. 
But of course, those are just models. We want to know uh, what's actually happening in the real world. And, and the story is somewhat positive here as well. So if you look at the interconnection queues for some of the biggest markets in the, in the US, biggest electricity markets, that is, it's really dominated by wind and solar, uh, even in areas without any explicit decarbonization goals. So if we look at the Southwest Power Pool, which is a, a market that covers a lot of the Great Plains states, uh, their interconnection queue is uh, almost entirely wind, solar, and batteries. There's a tiny little sliver there of, uh, of projects uh, that are not wind, solar, battery. So these are the types of, uh, these are the, the list of potential things that could come on, on, online in the next five years. And it's really dominated by these clean technologies. Similar story in the mid-continent in, independent system operator. This covers uh, the upper Midwest uh, all the way down to uh, Louisiana. And the ratio is flipped between wind and solar, but uh, the vast majority of the, the projects in the queue there are also uh, clean resources. Uh, if we look worldwide, a similar story, we have uh, two thirds of new capacity in 2019 being provided by, uh, by wind and solar uh, worldwide. So the question we wanna talk about today is if we think this is possible, uh, shifting to a system that really wind and solar are providing a bulk of the, uh, the energy uh, for the system, uh, we wanna know can today's markets support such a transition and do it in an efficient way? And if you uh, read about electricity markets enough, you see lots of headlines like this one, uh, how wind and solar will blow up power markets uh, according to this author, the main zero carbon energy sources are not compatible with conventional market design. And you'll see headlines like this a lot because uh, two attributes of these resources uh, are really putting a lot of stress on current market designs. One is variability. So we all know the sun goes down at night. Uh, we all know the uh, wind doesn't blow consistently. Uh, so that causes a lot of variability in the system. And then second, they have zero marginal cost. So there's no fuel cost to, to run these plants uh, in the basic model where price is equal to marginal cost. A lot of people say, okay, well, if price is equal to marginal cost and the price, uh, then the cost is gonna be zero and you can't run a market that way. So you get lots of objections on, on those grounds. So we wanna think about that question a little bit more formally and, and go back to the basic principle of competitive markets, which is that if we set uh, transparent and complete price signals, then that will eventually lead to efficient investment in resources and as well as operation of those resources. And if you go back to that theory, it really doesn't change due to variabil variability or zero marginal costs. So the, the things that people point to as the reasons why wind and solar are putting stress on markets don't really hold water as, as theoretically sound objections. Uh, but I wanna argue today that uh, there are things that need to change about the way those, uh, mar these markets are implemented in practice. And that has to do with this issue of transparent and complete price signals, where uh, I'm, I'm gonna argue that in practice, price signals and markets are incomplete in important ways. And that's, uh, that will continue to lead to uh, inefficient outcomes unless uh, those are addressed. So I'm gonna to try to convince you of two things uh, today. Uh, one is that uh, current markets do not adequately compensate flexible resources needed to complement wind and solar. So uh, in today, uh, today's markets, that's, uh, that function is basically served by natural gas, uh, but in the future, uh, there's hope that it will be provided by storage of various forms, demand response, and other new technologies. Uh, second thing I want to uh, claim is that current markets preferentially facilitate financing of high marginal cost technologies. So we know that wind and solar have zero marginal cost, so this would work against uh, a wind, wind and solar. So this is really a story about what's missing uh, from the markets, why are the markets incomplete? Uh, so I'm gonna start off by talking about the missing money problem, which is a, a well-known uh, issue that has gone, uh, goes back to the beginning of the, uh, the organized wholesale markets. 
Then I'm going to talk about these two new projects about missing incentives for flexibility and missing markets for, uh, for risk sharing. So starting with the, the background, I'm going to uh, talk about the missing money problem. So if you read about textbook ideal energy only markets, uh, all, all revenue for generators is supposed to be derived from the sale of energy and ancillary services. So under normal circumstances, you uh, stack up all of your uh, generating resources in order of their, their cost, and then you find where the supply curve intersects with the demand curve, and the price is set by the marginal cost of supply. Very occasionally in situations of peak demand, you get uh, the system is under stress, there's not enough capacity, and you get this uh, big ramp up, and the price is set by the uh, marginal value of load or reserves. So it, this could be industrial loads that are dropping off the system. It could be uh, that you're uh, willing to operate the system with fewer reserves, uh, and that is uh, effectively setting the price in the market. What those steep supply curves as well as demand curves lead to is extraordinarily high variance in the prices where you have a very small number of hours with very large prices. So this value of loss load uh, is, there's different estimates for it, but for example, Texas uses $9,000 a megawatt hour. So a couple orders of magnitude higher than, uh, than average prices. Uh, so you get a, a couple hours a year, a very few hours a year where the price spikes up to those very large levels. But then most of the time you're in this sub $100 a megawatt hour range for the price. So if you have a unit that has a, an operating cost of $100 a megawatt hour, uh, you're trying to operate whenever the price goes above that and you earn operating profits that are this shaded area for that a small number of hours. If you have a, a cheaper unit to run, a $10 megawatt hour uh, unit, your operating profits are this larger shaded area and you're running uh, more frequently. And that's generally to, to make up a, a larger fixed cost associated with the, the upfront investment in that lower cost uh, equipment. So the missing money problem, uh, which was recognized early on after the, the establishment of the markets is that uh, there's various out-of-market operator actions, and then there's also various offer caps and other actions taken for, for market power mitigation that result in suppressed prices, particularly during times of scarcity. So instead of this textbook ideal curve, we get a much, uh, we get the, uh, the price duration curve is kind of chopped off at this lower level, and it results in this gap of missing money where uh, resources ought to be getting revenue uh, in an efficient market sense, but they're not seeing that revenue because the price is not allowed to, uh, to go to those levels. So in uh, the idea to solve this is that, okay, we'll have capacity payments, we'll pay generators for capacity, and that will help us solve the missing money problem. So uh, if, on average, we want to essentially recreate the revenue that uh, resources would have received in an ideal energy only market. And the way we're gonna do that is just by giving them a, a capacity payment. And the, the result is we have a stable revenue stream that uh, takes the place of those volatile scarcity rents that are missing. So in theory, the idea here, or the intent is to create the same revenues and thus the same capacity mix as you would get in an ideal energy only market. Uh, in practice, it's uh, been hard to implement these capacity markets uh, to do that, uh, to meet the needs of that theory. And I wanna connect this to the first claim uh, of, of this talk which is that current markets do not adequately compensate flexible resources needed to complement wind and solar. And the, the capacity markets are a part of that story. So that brings me to the, the second thing that's missing, missing incentives. Uh, so uh, now we can finally get to a little math. In, in the long term, uh, the goal of capacity expansion, expansion in, a, in a socially optimal sense is we're trying to find a collection of investments that maximizes the value of operating the system, 
minus the upfront cost of the investments. So we have this investment cost upfront for each of our technologies. And then we have some expected surplus from operations given uh, uncertainty. So the uncertainty in uh, what the demand is gonna be, what the output of our various resources is gonna be and the availability of generators, transmission lines, et cetera. So to set up uh, as, as simple uh, as an example as possible, we're gonna, we're gonna consider a system with two technologies. One is fast. So the fast resource has a higher investment cost at, at $80 per megawatt. And then it's a little bit cheaper to operate and it's faster, so it has more ramping capability. The slower technology is cheaper to build up front, but then it's more expensive to operate and slower. Uh, the operating period for our purposes is just two hour long periods. So in the first period, we have uh, demand uniformly distributed between 80 and 120. So this is kind of a moderate demand. And then the uh, demand period two is uniformly distributed between 50 and 150. So this is a, a broader range in hour two. Uh, in, in addition, we, in the first hour, the system operator can predict what the decile of demand in the second hour is going to be. So uh, uh, within that range between 50 and 150, the system operator can, can figure out, is the demand going to be between 50 and 60, uh, between 60 and 70, between 70 and 80, et cetera, up to, up to the highest decile of 140 to 150. So what that means is that when the operator is making its dispatch decision in the first hour, it uh, is going to be aware of the distribution of demand in the second hour, and it's going to be aware of the ramping constraints that uh, both of the, of the technologies have. Uh, lastly, we need to set a value of lost load or an over and an overgeneration penalty, which I'll use ten thousand dollars a megawatt hour for. So in the operating problem itself, the, the uh, problem is to dispatch the system given those ramping constraints and the uncertain demand. So we have, this is kind of a dynamic programming setup where we have the, the value in period one and plus the expected surplus uh, or the value in, uh, in, in period two. We need to uh, satisfy the power balance constraints. So supply is gonna equal demand. And then we have resource limitations. So, uh, we can't produce more than we installed in the in the uh, in the capacity expansion decision. Fast forwarding to uh, period two, uh, now our problem is we need to dispatch the system uh, given the ramping constraints and the decisions we made both about the capacity investment and the dispatch decisions in period one. So uh, we are, we're adding ramping constraints that are dependent on the decision we made in the first period, and uh, and now what we get out of this model is uh, clearing prices equal to the, the duals on this power balance constraint. So um, the, the economic theory or the basic theory of competitive markets is that if we set prices equal to the duals on the power balance constraints, then uh, the markets will clear, we'll get efficient operations, and we'll get exactly the right amount of revenue or the right level of uh, the level of investment that's socially optimal for the system. So solving this uh, capacity expansion problem, we, we end up with a, an optimal capacity mix where we have uh, 86.3 megawatts of the faster resource, the faster technology, 63.4 uh, megawatts of the slower technology, uh, which gives a total of 149.7. Uh, megawatts. So we, we remember that the, the maximum demand is 150. So there are going to be very few uh, cases in the in hour two where we don't have enough capacity to meet the demand and we're, we'll need to shed load. Uh, at the same time, the, the ramp, the total ramp capability of the system is 64.5. Uh, so if the ramp between the two periods exceeds 64.5, we'll need to shed load as well. Uh, so as I, as I was saying, in an idealized system, the prices reflect those ramping constraints and support the optimal uh, capacity mix. So uh, zooming in on what happens if we have one of these uh, se severe ramping events, let's uh, suppose that 
at time t equals one, we have very low demand. So we have a demand uh, D1 of 80.5. And we know that the, the demand is gonna be very high in uh, period two. So it's uniformly distributed between 140 and 150. We have enough capacity to serve all the way up to 149.7, but we only have enough ramp capability to serve up to 145 in this situation. So what that means is that there's a 50% chance that we're going to need to shed load. If demand turns out to be higher than 150, uh, 145, then we're gonna need to shed load. And the cost of doing that is $10,000 a megawatt hour. If we take the theory uh, at face value and set efficient prices, uh, that includes the possibility of that power balance violation at time t equals two. So what we end up with is a price of negative 4,955 in period one. And then in period two, we have either a price of 30, which is the, the cost of the, the more expensive slow generator, uh, if there's enough ramping, or a cost of 10,000 if we end up needing to uh, shed load. So on average, we get a price of $30 across both periods and across all realizations of, uh, of demanded period two. But both generators will be profitable in expectation because of that higher output, uh, higher production in, uh, in the second period. But now we can think about what happens if we have a price floor and a price cap in the market. So let's say we have a price floor of negative 150 uh, and a price cap of $1,000 uh, a megawatt hour. So these uh, are kind of typical of, of markets in the US. If we calculate profit per unit capacity without the cap and floor, so this is what the ideal, the textbook ideal prices say, we get a profit of $3,008 a megawatt for the fast uh, generator and a you know, $1,019 a megawatt for the uh, slow generator. If we introduce that cap and floor on the prices, the profit uh, per unit capacity drops for both. So it drops to 430 for the fast generator and down to 340 for the uh, slow generator. But now what happens is if you consider how much revenue is missing or the missing money for each of the generators, it's really a much larger value for the fast generator than it is for the slow generator. And the reason for that is because the, the genesis of the price spike is, is the ramping, it's not uh, capacity itself. So if you try to make up the missing money with a uniform capacity payment, uh, as, as the markets do at present, it will inevitably either un overcompensate the slow resource or undercompensate the fast one. So I told you I was gonna to try to convince you that current markets don't uh, adequately compensate flexible resources and uniform capacity payments uh, contribute to that uh, inadequate compensation. Um, uh, if you're, if you're uh, curious about this more, I talk about a few other mechanisms that, that can lead to inadequate compensation in the, the paper that this draws from. So the second topic uh, I wanted to talk about is uh, uh, missing markets. So uh, in addition to missing money, liberalized electricity systems are generally thought to have insufficient long-term risk sharing. So in theory, uh, market participants ought to project future revenues based on some consistent market model, and they ought to trade risk through a variety of, of hedging mechanisms. In practice, uh, we, there's not a lot of evidence or there's not as much evidence as we would hope for that. It's difficult to project future revenues. So there's a lot of uh, uh, actuarial risk and a lot of uh, differing opinions on what the, the future prices will be, particularly because the market rules change frequently and the market conditions change uh, so rapidly. And uh, just in general, the demand side of the market is much less willing and able to sign long-term contracts than the supply side of the market. So if you think about the problem from uh, the perspective of an investor in generation, they uh, are gonna look not just at an average year for what they think uh, their investment uh, will make, 
they want to look at a range of potential future operating conditions. So we have this average year that I showed in the, in the chart before, but we might have some years with lower peak demand where the, the prices never spike. We might have some years with higher than peak demand or higher peak demand where the prices spike more frequently. We might have years with lower fuel costs or years with higher fuel costs. And they want to get a sense of the range of possible uh, revenues that they'll see when they're making their investment decision. Uh, this I, I took from some modeling of the ERCOT system in Texas. And the, the major point here is that if, uh, if you look at the median line here, it's well below the average line. So what that means is that in the median year, uh, the average generator in, in Texas is not going to be making anywhere near what it needs to sustain its operations. So it's really depending on these years up in the uh, 90 to 95th percentile, which, uh, during which they earn three times the average or more uh, to sustain its overall, overall operation. So from a financing point of view, it needs to be able to smooth the revenues and the interannual volatility in, in the revenues. Uh, capacity markets uh, play an important role in reducing the risk given that volatility and fundamental value and given the lack of, of long-term risk trading uh, elsewhere. So this is a quote from uh, the Cost of Capital Outlook that uh, Norm Rose Fulbright hosts and uh, Ralph Joan at Vestex says, a uh, lender size at 1.15x revenue from the capacity price. Sometimes we were open to giving credit on a conservative merchant energy revenue forecast. We would probably use a 2.0, 2.5x uh, debt service coverage ratio. So what he's saying is that uh, revenue from the capacity markets is seen as far more stable, far more reliable than revenue from uh, the energy markets. But what that means from the customer's point of view is that the presence of the capacity market shifts risk back to customers and uh, partially fills the void left by the missing markets for long-term risk sharing. Uh, the issue that I want to highlight is that the missing money replaced by capacity markets really aligns well with the operating profits for higher cost units. So if you look at a unit with a, a low $10 megawatt uh, marginal cost, about 83% of its uh, profits in uh, PJM on the year I, I did this calculation uh, should come from the energy market. About the, the remaining 17% uh, would come from the capacity market. This is assuming that uh, ancillary service revenues and, and uh, other revenue streams are, are uh, excluded. If you have a higher marginal cost unit, so $100 a megawatt hour, uh, only the, the ratio is flipped. So only 10% of its profits come from the energy market. Uh, really, the bulk of its profits come from the, uh, the capacity side. So what that means is that uh, the capacity market really facilitates the financing of high marginal cost units relative to low marginal cost units. It's making it uh, very easy for those higher cost units to, to obtain financing, uh, given how those, how those uh, Revenues are viewed by lenders. So uh, I want to dig in a little bit more into this second claim that current markets preferentially facilitate financing of high marginal cost technologies by doing a little bit more math. So in the traditional optimization framework, this is the theory under which the capacity markets were uh, developed. Uh, we have an exogenous risk embedded in the investment cost for each resource. So this is similar to what I showed before, where we have an investment cost, and that's annualized according to some weighted average cost of capital that's exogenously determined. After that, we're risk neutral with respect to some nominal probability distribution uh, describing the operating conditions over the, over the life of the asset. If you solve that exogenous risk, uh, or that problem with exogenous risk, uh, you can solve a social optimization problem, and that gives the same thing as the uh, competitive equilibrium. And the equilibrium conditions uh, say that every installed technology in a competitive market ought to have zero expected profit. So 
You can write that equilibrium condition uh, like this, where we have the operating profit for a generator uh, in each scenario. So these scenarios are mega, uh, given the chosen capacity mix. And the weighted average of those operating profits needs to be precisely equal to the, uh, the investment cost. So the, uh, uh, the overall profit in expectation is zero. When you introduce a capacity market, you change the distribution of when the uh, profits occur. Uh, so you smooth the interannual volatility, but you don't change this sum. And so you don't change this equilibrium condition and you get the same uh, capacity mix that, uh, that you get in, in the energy only, in the ideal textbook uh, analysis. What we want to think about doing is instead endogenizing risk. So instead of expected value, we have an averse risk measure. So the capacity investors and capacity are risk averse and we form a, an equilibrium problem. So replacing that equilibrium condition from before with an averse risk measure on the operating profit. And we have an investment cost annualized at the risk-free rate. So now we, we have, uh, we're gonna have a, a cost of capital that's endogenously determined by the, uh, the risk measure that we use. If you model it like this, then it, when you introduce a capacity market, it changes the distribution of the operating profits and therefore changes the capacity mix arising in the system. So uh, we form an uh, equilibrium model where we have several simple mathematical programs that all need to be solved uh, simultaneously. So we have a, a dispatch problem for uh, operating the system. We have the generators problem who are the generators are maximizing risk averse profit. The load side is uh, optimizing risk averse consumption. Uh, we have financial markets for, for various hedging instruments uh, that need to clear. And then we have uh, the generator entry exit decisions. Risk aversion itself could push the capacity mix really in any direction, depending on uh, which type of risk the market participants are most concerned about and, and what kinds of hedging mechanisms are available uh, to trade risk between the market participants. So in this, uh, in this example, I'll focus on three risks and three trades corresponding to three uh, archetypal technologies. So to start off, we have uh, a baseload plant you can think about a, a large nuclear unit uh, where the risk uh, that's, that they're really concerned about is fuel costs and specifically fuel costs of more expensive uh, generators that are gonna be setting the price above them. Uh, the trade that's most useful for them is a forward contract or a future or a power purchase agreement. We also have a variable technology. So this could be a wind farm. Uh, the risk for them is availability. So. Uh, their output, the availability of the wind or the sun, might not match up well with when power prices are the highest. And so the trade that's uh, both best suited to them is what's called a unit contingent power purchase agreement, uh, or PPA, that tracks the availability of the, uh, the output of the resource. Uh, lastly, we have a peaker. Uh, the risk for them is the, uh, the overall demand level in the system. So if the demand is, is low, then a peaker will never be dispatched and never make any money. If the demand is high, then uh, they'll be in high demand and, and make more money. So the, the trade that's best suited for them is an option contract. If you set the strike price of uh, the option contract near the typical offer perhaps in the, in the market, so about $1,000 a megawatt hour in, in our example, then that contract resembles a capacity mechanism. So to sketch out this equilibrium model, uh, we have capacity, uh, generation capacity and financial trading decisions made in the first stage, and then we have many uh, potential operating scenarios uh, in the second. Both entry and dispatch are perfectly competitive. Uh, investors in generation make entry and exit decisions according to a coherent risk measure on profit. Um, all market participants share the same nominal distribution of second stage operating scenarios, but not necessarily the same risk measure. Uh, lastly, I'll, I'll mention that if we had complete markets in risk, 
what that would mean in the theory is that you would have, uh, we would allow market participants to trade against every possible future scenario. So there would be a, a, an instrument corresponding to every scenario. If you make that assumption, then you can reformulate the, uh, the equilibrium problem as an optimization problem. Mm. Uh, so I'll use the results of that optimization problem to assess how important uh, incomplete markets are. We have a, a, a numerical example based on PJM uh, using data from 2017. We have the three technologies that I mentioned, those three sources of uncertainty, and then uh, eight possibilities for trades. So we could allow any subset of the uh, futures, options, and unit contingent contracts uh, uh, and make them available for trading. So if we don't allow any risk trading, uh, we end up with this capacity mix where we have uh, 38.7 gigawatts of base load, 97.6 of the uh, peaking uh, technology, and 118.1 of uh, variable. And so I'm going to add one contract at a time and demonstrate what that does to the equilibrium mix. So if you add only the unit contingent contracts that are suited to the variable technology, that uh, shifts the equilibrium mix toward the uh, the variable technology. If you add only the option, uh, it turns out to push things toward both the peaking technology and the variable, and you uh, completely eliminate the base load technology from the system. If you eliminate only the future, then it shifts the resource mix toward the, uh, toward the base load technology. And these are in ordered uh, in order of welfare compared to the uh, uh, social optimum. So for the situations with two or three trades allowed, I'm gonna show it in reverse. So starting with the, if we allow all contracts, we get uh, a mix with 42.5 gigawatts of base load, 96.6 of the peaker and 120.4 of the variable. So I'm gonna subtract one at a time to do the same thing. If we take out the option contract, the, the mix moves away from the, the peaking technology. If we take out the future, uh, we move away from the base load. And if we take out the unit contingent, it, uh, it moves away from the variable technology. Again, these are ordered in, in social welfare. So the best results are achieved if you have as close to complete markets in risk sharing as, as, uh, as you can. In that situation where all, all trades are available, it's, uh, this really shows up where the technologies or the investors in the technologies prefer to trade the contract that's best adapted to its individual risk profile. So the base load uh, plant is trading or buying or uh, selling futures. The uh, peaker is selling options. The variable technology is selling unit contingent contracts. There's a couple mixed in, a couple futures mixed in here, a couple options mixed in for the base load plant but the bulk of the trading is on the instrument that's adapted to that technology's risk profile. So uh, returning to the original uh, uh, claim, uh, I'm saying that current markets preferentially facilitate financing of high marginal cost technologies, essentially because we've introduced these capacity payments that are particularly well suited to the risk profile of high marginal cost resources. We've uh, made those capacity payments, uh, capacity, those risk trades essentially mandatory. So we've reduced uh, transaction costs to, to essentially nothing, but we haven't done anything comparable for, uh, for other technologies. So returning to the question at the top, can today's market support a transition? Um, I think that uh, we need reforms both to short-term price formation uh, and to long-term resource adequacy mechanisms to really facilitate efficient adoption of uh, new technologies, uh, wind and solar included. Uh, so just to close up, I'll, I'll post uh, a couple uh, links of uh, papers that uh, I drew this uh, talk from. I also want to acknowledge, especially in the second paper, uh, my co-authors Dave Morton and uh, at Northwestern and uh, Dick O'Neill, who uh, at the time we wrote this was at, at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, but has since moved to RPE. Uh, so with that, uh, thank, thank you all for your uh, attention. 
There's a question in the chat. Let me see if I can pull that up. Uh, so the question is from uh, Shinbo Gang. Yeah, okay. So the um, so this was a question about the first example with the flexibility. Um, in in both uh, in the first, so both of the generators in that first example uh, have less profit, uh, but uh, the profit that they do get is less volatile in, in expectation. So um, I think you could uh, look at that in the same style as we uh, looked at the the risk in the second part of the talk, where uh, clearly there's this trade-off where if you allow full-fledged price volatility, uh, that's one way of inducing the right level of investment in flexible resources, because flexible resources are able to take advantage of that full-fledged price volatility. But if you go uh, if you go in that direction, you really need to also, at the same time, introduce financial instruments that allow them to manage the risk associated with that price volatility. Um, so, uh, so getting that trade-off uh, correct is, is a challenging uh, problem. And a lot of the markets have, in effect, chosen to suppress the volatility um, in, in various ways. And I, I think the, the challenge that I'm pointing out in the paper is that they have suppressed the volatility, but uh, really not recognized that they've done so and not uh, put in a replacement way to, to incentivize flexible generation. Yeah, uh, thank you for answering this question. Actually, I, I asked this question well, uh, maybe when you were on page 32 and your whole section two is answering that question. Uh, I have one follow-up. Yeah, one, one follow-up question about this. Uh, do you think it's the market price should reflect like based on the risk preferences? So currently, the the prices are is like a risk neutral price. Do you think that's necessary? Yeah. Well, I think that you do need to set uh, uh, set a market clearing price. So you need to set prices in such a way that the the supply and demand will be equal, and uh, and the only way of doing that from the system operator's pers uh, perspective is uh, based on the bids and offers of the um, uh, of the market participants, and and to do so in a risk neutral way. Um, I think that uh, I would expect that market participants ought to be including their risk preferences in the offers that they're making. So. Uh, they'll only be willing to sell for a higher price, or they'll, uh, um, or they'll be reluctant to uh, participate in the market if you make things too risky for them without also giving them uh, a way to manage that risk. Um, so I think the the correct thing to do is to set the, the is to clear the market in a risk neutral way, uh, but to be cognizant of the fact that. Uh, the market participants are going to be adjusting their uh, their offers uh, on the basis of their risk uh, their risk references. Yeah, got it. Thank you, Jacob. Thanks for the um, talk. It was uh, very interesting. Um, really cool stuff. I was curious. Um, um, so, I, I have I know a few people who are working on. Uh, developing elasticity in demand by uh, being able to save up. Um, energy there. Um, ideas like heating swimming pools in off-peak hours or, you know, things like that. To what extent would you still need to redesign the markets if you had a much more flexible, uh, much more elasticity or flexibility in demand? Uh, I, I would say that in general, the more elasticity in demand you have, the, the better the markets will function. Uh, right now, we have um, somewhat elaborate administrative mechanisms to kind of mimic the price responsive demand. And um, in the extreme, you get to situations where you have to shed load or reduce voltage or things like that uh, to, uh, to maintain balance. It'd be far preferable if people uh, came off the, the system themselves and, and did so in a, in a somewhat efficient way. Um, as it stands right now, we 
have proxy values for the cost of those operator actions, like sh uh, the shed shedding load and doing voltage reductions and rolling blackouts and things of that nature that um, uh, might be uh, might be good proxies or might not be, and we don't really have a I, I would say a great way of uh, of assessing that. Um, as to whether it necessitates a market design change, I think there are uh, questions about, or there are certainly uh, uh, implementation challenges in uh, making sure those, uh, the people operating the hot water uh, uh, heaters or the pool pumps or things like that have an ability to actually offer into the market. Um, there's a slight difference between uh, are they offering into the market or bidding in the market versus are they waiting for the system operator to post a price and just reacting after the fact. Um, and uh, I think for the near future, they will just be waiting for the prices to post and then reacting after the fact, which I think helps, it's, it's helpful, but um, if you get too much of that in the long run, you would rather have them uh, participating and setting the price at the time of the, of the market clearing. Just as a follow up to that, please. Um, when one thinks about the um, sort of smart meters and internet of things and so forth, these are all very, very small contributions. So it's hard to imagine, at least for me, that that would have much impact on the, on the market prices. Does that mean we, we, that we would need some sort of consolidators to get some market heft? Yeah, so there's, well, I think there's two directions this could go. Uh, at present, what seems to be happening is that there's uh, aggregators of distributed energy resources that will pool together uh, a large number of resources, collect them and, and bid them together to the, the wholesale markets. And there's actually just a FERC order uh, a few weeks ago, uh, kind of codifying the logic of how those aggregators should be allowed to participate in the, in the wholesale markets. Uh, the other mechanism is to uh, develop distribution level marketplaces and uh, ways of trading at, at, on the very small scales uh, at the distribution level where uh, individual devices and things like that uh, could have more relevance. So there's people working on um, the, the, how you would structure the, the governance, the regulatory mechanisms, uh, the actual uh, functioning of the market if you were to try to implement a distribution level uh, market um, to solve some of those issues. Thank you. Um, professor, thank you for a nice talk. I have a question. Actually, I have two questions. Uh, so my first question is for the missing money problem that uh, actually every generator, they individually have different kind of missing money. So uh, in the capacity market, it's like ISO take care of this missing money and uh, redesign the capacity market. So if it's possible for individual generators to consider the missing money problem in their optimization, profit optimization, and generate some bids differently to cover the missing money problem. Yeah, in another way we can say uh, in some scarcity issues, the generator can bid a high price for several last megawatts they generate, and uh, that way they can cover the missing money back. Yeah, so the, the danger with the uh, generators just changing their offers to, 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 to try to earn the money that they need is that they can just get out competed and not get dispatched and not make any money. So. Uh, so the risk for them is they, uh, they might be able to change their offer uh, in the hopes that they'd be able to get enough money, um, yeah. but, uh, but then end up just pricing themselves out of the market. Um, so uh, the, I think that um, if you have a sufficiently competitive market, they, they shouldn't be able to, to do that uh, to, uh, to a significant degree. Um, in addition to that, there's, uh, because of the, the history of these markets, and particularly the experience in California, uh, right after the, the markets were being set up, uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission tends to be very aware of the potential to, uh, to manipulate prices, especially in times of scarcity. And they're very uh, 
um, reluctant to allow generators to, to, uh, to do that in situations where they might have market power. Uh, another question is like uh, the missing money happens in real time and the capacity market compensate them, I think in the investment. So uh, how do you make sure that that generator receive the compensation they will actually contribute in the scarcity issue? It's possible that some generator receive the money in the capacity market and in the scarcity issue, they should generate to avoid, yeah, they should generate to avoid the load shedding but they just don't do that. Yeah, well, you've, you've hit the nail on one of the big problems in the, the running of these markets, which is you, uh, you need to make an assessment in, in the case of the, the organized capacity markets three years in advance of how much capacity will you need and what should be the credit of any individual generator or any individual resource class uh, toward that, uh, that capacity. Um, so uh, back in 2014, uh, in, the, in the Eastern United States, we had a, a polar vortex where um, we had very cold weather for an extended stretch. And it resulted in a large number of maintenance failures at gas plants. It resulted in a, a large number of plants having a insecure fuel supply where they, they couldn't actually get fuel to run. And we had a, a, a large number of plants that uh, were offline, uh, way larger than anything anticipated in the capacity planning process, mostly because that planning process had been anticipating a summer peak rather than a, a winter peak. Um, so uh, in the wake of that event, uh, most of the, the markets in the UN United States completely revamped their system and tried to introduce a way to penalize generators after the fact if they failed to deliver on their capacity obligations. Um, I'm of the opinion that that was not actually successfully accomplished, um, that the, the penalties they put in place are not, uh, uh, not really uh, efficient to, to, to get the, the, uh, the right behavior from the, from the generators, but it has had some benefit in terms of preparing for, for subsequent winters and uh, and getting things slightly closer to uh, to efficient. I see. Uh, because actually, currently in the real time market, we have lost opportunity costs compensated after the generator missing some money in some scarcity or ramping issue. Yeah. So I'm thinking whether it's better to compensate after the behavior happened, or is better to compensate before in the capacity. But yeah. that may be related to the investment problem to encourage that. Right, right. So I think that part of what uh, the advocates of capacity markets would say is that they want to have that three-year forward price signal in order to be able to show to their lenders and their investors we're going to get we're going to get paid this uh, three years from now, so you can you can trust us to to give you back your money. Um, mm -hmm. So. Uh, I think that uh, it certainly causes some some problems because the predictions are hard, especially about the future, and, and you you don't know what uh, what resources are actually going to how they're actually going to perform three years from now. So it certainly causes some issues. Right now, the topic is uh, how do we credit storage resources? So there's a lot of batteries being put in place. Batteries typically have four hours worth of charge. So if you have a capacity event that lasts two hours and they can discharge uh, and comfortably cover the length of the capacity event, um, that's, that's great. But if you have a capacity event that lasts six hours, then, uh, then they're not so effective. And so there's a, a big challenge in trying to determine in advance, how are we going to credit a four-hour battery, an eight-hour battery, et cetera, for different uh, for capacity payments? And it's not a, not a straightforward uh, not a straightforward problem. Yeah, thank you. I think clapping over, over online never seems to work, but I think we're all really grateful to you for giving your talk, Jacob. It was very interesting, and the electricity market area just seems to be uh, on fire, and it's really great that you're working in that space. So thank you again for in a very interesting talk. Thank you, and thanks, everyone, for, uh, for coming. Okay. Bye, all.